Hello and welcome to the ninth video in the introduction to our workshop series run by um, the QMI Berkhoff Statistics Unit. Um, so hopefully you've seen some of the earlier videos or gone to the workshops or at least um, seen the work workshop material booklet because um, these videos are just meant to be additional help rather than the main form of education for the introduction to our series. Um, I've talked about the statistics, the statistics unit in previous videos and where they can be found and what kind of services we can offer and also our contact details. Um, also talked about what um, things we need for the workshops. In this specific video, we'll be using the WK1 underscore 9 underscore 10 underscore WK3 underscore 16 underscore pulse data text CSV. We'll also be using the car package. So hopefully you've run the install.packages um, function with car there. So today we're going to be continuing some basic analyses. So from section 16 of the book. Um, so it's, this one's going to be on continuous analysis. So that's analysis of continuous quantitative data as opposed to the categorical data in the previous video. Like before, we're not going to get too much into the theory or the how and the why behind each of these tests. Um, that's not what this workshop or these videos are about. Um, so if you want to learn more about continuous analysis, there are, we can suggest some resources to you. You can come see us and we offer some other educational um, things for that. Um, this is more to show you how to do these things in R than anything else. So hopefully you've got that data set saved and you know where it is because you'll want to set your working directory to the folder where that data set is saved and then use the read.csv function to read it in. And we're going to jump across to R Studio. So first up, we have the t-test. And the t-test is a very popular, very commonly used um, test used to compare um, the distributions, the center of the distributions between two groups, um, whether it be paired or not, we'll get into that. And so um, because the t-test is so common, over time there has become a couple of different ways to use the t-test to fit different programming styles of people that have used stats. Um, so there's a couple of different ways depending on how your data is set up and how you want to do it. So for the first way to set up the t-test function, um, the function is t.test. Yeah, so that's just t.test. I've got this comment to just to talk about the examples first. So it's t.test, and the first way to use it is to compare two vectors or two variables in a data set. So that's what we've got here. So for example, I've just got example data here, and then dollar sign, and then it's group one variable and group two variable. So this would be the case if we had, for some reason we had our data set up so that the two vectors that were, that represent the two groups we want to compare were in two separate variables. This is how we could do that. Um, but only if the data from the two groups exists in two separate variables or two separate vectors. Um, the probably more common way to do it is if the variable is already in the one, so the data is already in the one variable and we have say a grouping variable. So this is how example is done here. So example data dollar sign, the dependent variable, that variable we want to see if there's a difference. So that's for, there for both X and Y or for both groups. And then for the first one, we have our square brackets saying the logical condition equals is group equivalent to one. And for the second one, that's the group equivalent to two. So that's basically saying we have our quantitative variable in the one vector or the one variable in a data frame. And then we use our logical condition to break that variable up into the data for the two groups. And that's where we do a t-test. Now, the most common way to do a t-test generally um, in R, because it, and this way is the most common possibly because it links up so much with other statistical modeling that we use R for, is to use R's formula notation. So this is how it's done here. Still just using the example. So it's t.test, the t.test, that's the t.test function. What we have here is we have dependent variable, then we have a tilde, and then we have a group variable name. So 
Notice I've not got exclamation point, I'm um, not exclamation points, quotation marks. I don't have quotation marks around these two things. Um, we just have set up a formula like that. I've got a comma, and then I've got data equals the data that we're using. So this is the a more common way to do it because this list lines up with other types of modeling functions that we'll get to later. So we've got dependent variable, um, that's split by, or the group and that's the data there. So the function will know that these variable names come from example data. Um, and yes, I do acknowledge that it can be confusing that there are a number of different ways um, to use this. And that if we're doing it two separate vectors, it goes X then Y. Um, but in this case, it goes Y then X. It's a little bit confusing, but we can deal with that. Um, so now that we've talked quickly about those examples, again, if that was too quick for the explanation, by all means, there is the booklet that you can read over again. You can pause the video and go back, or of course you can come to the workshops. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the pulse one variable in our data set and compare it between the two groups, the group that sat and the group that ran. Um, remembering that our data set has a bunch of information about um, fictional students, what normal exercise they do, what group they're assigned to in some experiment where they had their pulse measured, then they either sat or ran, and they had their second pulse measured. Um, so what we're going to do is we want to look at the difference between the first pulse in the two groups. So let's just run a histogram. So it's always good to check your data before you do anything. So we've got a histogram there of the pulse one in the group that um, sat. And then we've got pulse one in the group that ran. So there's potentially an issue there because we've got what appears to be an outlier in the second group. We might go through and check that to see if it should be removed or um, corrected. These are always important things to do, but we're not going to worry about them right now. Um, so now we're going to use the formula notation. So we've got t test, pulse data. So what I, I've still got the vectors set up here like this, where it's the dependent variable as a split by the group variable. In the previous example, I did have the data equals, so I could have, so I could do this line of code the exact same as I would have done previously and had data equals pulse data. Um, and I think this just goes to show there's lots of different ways you can do this. So we're showing you the many different ways because you might come across all of them in different things. So I've got the dependent variable as a dependent on the group variable. And that gives us the t-test output there. And this is the exact same output will be done by this function. Um, so there are many ways to do it, depending if you want to have that data input as a specific argument, or if you want to just have the two vectors um, in the formula notation. Um, we are not including the homogeneity of variances assumption here, because we can see that there are potential issues with the distribution, which is why Welch's two sample t-test is coming out. We might talk about that in just a second. Um, so this is not the typical student's t-test. Um, and we'll talk more about that potentially in a second. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to subset to compare groups. Um, so that was like the second one we did before. The second example, I'm sorry, before when we had the subset this way. And this time we are going to assume the homogeneity of variances is true. So that's we're done with this bar dot equal argument. So I'm just going to put my cursor there, control enter. And this time I just get the normal two sample t-test. Um, so the results are very similar to the one before because there um, is not that much difference between the two groups because it's just the pulse normally without being affected by running or not running. Um, 
And of course, though, if we did get rid of that um, large value in the second group, um, not much changes. The p-value is a bit different, but it's still not significant. So like we talked about in the previous video, you can often have this var equal or something similar to change the assumptions around the test. Um, so the t-test function will often try and give you Welch's t-test by default. Um, that's a t-test that does not rely heavily on the equality of variances or the homogeneity of variances um, between the groups. But if you want to just do the normal student's t-test, you do have to say var equal equals var dot equal equals true um, to make sure that occurs. We're not going to talk too much about the theory behind the different versions of the t-test there, but, um, but just so that you're aware of that. Okay, so the t-test is a parametric test. And there is the non-parametric version of that, which is the Mann whitney u test. Um, so that's generally if your distributions of your two, or the variables in the two groups are not normally distributed or there's something else affecting them. So to do the Mann-Whitney test, we have to use the Wilcox.test function. Um, that's just how they're lumped together in the R functions. And so this one goes in as a two vector option. So there's the vector of pulse one, and it's been subgrouped to have those just that sat. And the vector of pulse one that has been subgrouped, um, use the square brackets to get a subset that is just ran. Also got the correct equals false there just to make sure that it's the version of the man whitney u test that we want. So control enter on that line. And this is the result that I get out. Man whitney and Wilcox and rank some test are equivalent names. While we're talking about t-tests, there is also the paired t-test. Um, so that's when you have a value before and after, or um, two variables that are related and you want to see if there's a difference between the two variables and the measurements in each variable are related somehow. So here we're going to do that for pulse one and pulse two, because each person in our data set has a pulse one and has a pulse two. So the data is therefore paired, so we can do a paired t-test to see if there's a difference between pulse one and pulse two. Um, so that's very similar to the t-test where it's the x and the y. So there's the two vector input, and we have the extra input of paired equals true. So I have that line, or I can just have my cursor of that line, control enter, and I get the paired t-test result, um, which does suggest significant that the difference is there. Now, of course, if this was a legitimate um, data set, and uh, this is a legitimate study, we'd probably do look at the differences between pulse one and pulse two separately for running and sitting. We're not gonna do that right now. These are just for examples. Um, so this is, if you look at this, this is probably one of the reasons why the t-test has a couple of different ways it can be used. Um, the formula notation used lines up a lot with how a lot of modeling, um, linear models, et cetera, and further models are done in R. Um, so it makes sense to also have that same way of doing things with the t-test um, that to have a consistency that way um, but then it also makes it easier to for the, like the t-test function to have the same functionality for when it's paired to have those two variables set up like that so in that way the t-test is versatile to be whatever frame of mind you're working with um, and whatever's easier for you so as opposed to it just trying to be complicated um, so it's versatile in that sense and that there's many different ways you can use it, whichever is easier for you. Um, now, of course, the paired t-test is still a parametric test. And so the non-parametric version is the Wilcox and signed rank test, um, which is done with Wilcox, the Wilcox test function like before. The pulse one and pulse two variables are our two variables that we're comparing. We have paired equals true to say that it's a paired test. And we're also adding the correct equals false to make, um, to make sure we get the default test that we want. Control enter on that line and we get the Wilcox and signed rank test. That also has a significant p-value. Okay, so lastly, but also majorly is ANOVA. ANOVA is a very um, 
and big deal in statistics, especially basic statistics. Um, actually, not lastly, sorry, um, but nextly. <laughs> um, so there's a, couple, there's a few different ways to deal with ANOVA in R. There is the basic analysis of variance function, which is the AOV function. Um, and so we're just going to subset, we're going to do this on a subset just so we can get some significance and talk about that. So the AOV function takes input with a formula notation. So what we're doing here is we're comparing pulse one between each of the exercise groups. So exercise has moderate, high and low. So pulse one compared between the three exercise groups. So because it's more than two groups, we have to use an ANOVA. And we're just gonna look at the subset of the data that is male participants. Um, so we can do that straight into this formula. We, I'm sorry, this function. We don't need to make a separate data set object that is just the male data. We can do that right here. So we're doing it here with the subset function. We could also do it with square brackets if we wanted to. Um, so of course I could just run this line of code specific here, just the function. And this is what I would get. So that you'd get, give me the call that I gave, um, some of the important terms. Um, but what I can also do is save it as an object. So if I run this line of code and save the output as an object called my ANOVA, I can see that it's actually a list of 13, meaning that there's 13 different things that has been taken from the output of the AOV function. Um, so it includes coefficients, residuals, effects, fitted values, lots of things there. And then if I then do a summary on that my ANOVA object, um, I can get the values for the ANOVA table, so the degrees of freedom, mean sum squares, F value, P value. Basically, I can get a bit more information to summarize the results. Um, so that's why, so this is a common thing often done with test output and model output. So we could have done similar things for the t-test. Um, most function um, testing and modeling function outputs have a lot more than is just printed to the screen. So it's sometimes very useful to save that and then run a summary object on that object or just put it straight into a summary function. Um, now, because we have significance between the groups for the male subjects, we can do pairwise comparisons. Um, again, I'm aware we are moving very quickly through this. This video is just to um, give another example of showing how the things are working in real time. Um, it's not necessarily talking about the theory behind these two concepts. Um, so check out the book for a little bit more of that or come to us or come to other workshops. So that we're going to use the, we're going to use the pairwise heat test to do pairwise comparisons. There's lots of different ways to do pairwise comparisons. So this pairwise heat test is just comparing pulse one for males between the exercise groups for males. Um, having the exact same thing in these square brackets will mean the same elements, matching elements from those pulse one and exercise vectors will be used for the function. And we're also using a bond for any correction for the P adjustment. Um, always, it's always a good idea to check out in the help function, um, the test you might be using. So you could look up pairwise t test and see all the different inputs that you are, or the arguments you're required to do, or might not be required to do. So if I run this line of code, I can see the p-values between the different groups and see that there's not a significant difference between the groups using that um, comparison. Anyway, moving on. Um, so the AOV is a fairly simple function in terms of it just does really quickly comparisons between multiple groups um, for one-way analysis variance. It can start to get a bit more complicated when you have more effects, and especially if you start having interaction effects. Um, we're not going into the statistical theory behind um, more effects in the ANOVA, so like stuff like two-way ANOVA um, and interaction effects. Um, this is just going to show you that it's a little bit more complicated. So if you start to do that more complicated analysis, for starters, if you're not really across those topics, it'd be really good to talk to a statistician um, to make sure you're doing it right. 
and then also um, read up a bit more about ANOVA and more complicated analysis of variance in R. Um, but this is to show you what can happen. So what I've got here is I'm comparing pulse, but I'm comparing it with both the effects of exercise and alcohol. Um, I'm going to save the output of that into my ANOVA 2. I'm again using just a subset of the male participants. So if I run that line of code and give a summary, I can see I've got an exercise and an alcohol effect. Um, exercise being significant, alcohol not being significant. Um, now, when I, if I were to run that same, essentially same function, except with alcohol and exercise around the other way, um, and save that as an object and then do a summary on that, I get different results. Um, in terms of the clinical meaningfulness, exercise is still significant and alcohol isn't, but the p-values are different and the sums of squares are different. Um, so this really does come down to what is happening in the background. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because um, this is just aiming to get you to get to get you into moving into R yourself. And honestly, the best way to learn R is just by, by learning yourself and teaching yourself. So this is just really about learning the basics. So what we're trying to do here is just show you that there are some things here that you need to be aware of um, when your analysis gets a little bit more complicated for some things. So use, just using the AOV function when there's more than one effect, the sums of squares aren't calculated the same way if you reverse on the order of your effects. So this is where the car package can come in. Um, and generally what we start to do there is there is different types of sums of squares and a way to calculate sums of squares when you have multiple effects in your ANOVA. Um, so there's the ANOVA function from car. It has a capital A. Um, its input is a linear model. Um, and we haven't talked about that yet but we will soon. So that linear model um, is very similar to the what we've done before with a formulation of pulse one and exercise, data being the subset. So it does the capital A ANOVA function on the linear model function, which is LM here. And that output is being saved as an object. And as you can see here that we've done type two tests. There's also a type three. Um, so that's done here. So I'll run that line of code. I get the same results. Except one of them is looking at an intercept as well. Just different ways of calculating similar things when we only have one effect. Um, but when it really comes into important is when we have two effects here. So this first one is using type two effects, which is very similar to what we saw before, sort of. And then also type three effects here when we use type three. And type two and type three are equivalent here. Now, that's a lot to take in and it's probably a lot given that we're not really going to the theory behind it to explain what's happening there. Um, again, this is just not the purpose of these videos. These videos and these workshops are designed to show you how to get into using analysis in R. And so I guess one way of looking at this is if you don't understand the types of sums of squares and the way you should be doing your NOVA if it's correct, talk to a statistician who does come and see a statistics unit and we can help you make sure that you're, the model that you're setting up and the way you're comparing your effects is correct. Um, moving on, the Kruskal Wallace is the non-parametric version of ANOVA. This is done with the Kruskal dot test. So we've got pulse one, tilde exercise using our formula notation. We've got a data argument saying that data is a subset of pulse data where gender is male. So that's the Kruskal Wallace rank sum test. It's significant. And then we can also do pairwise Wilcox test with the pairwise dot Wilcox dot text test function. Um, again, with an X 
with a um, dependent variable input and then an, a grouping variable input there. Um, and sometimes you'll get these warning me um, messages, especially for rank tests, if some of the ranks um, resolve to be ties. Um, so again, doesn't necessarily mean that your results are incorrect, but it's ties are something definitely to be aware of in your data. And of course, talk to a statistician to make sure the right thing is happening for your data. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to correlation. So correlation is where we're looking at the linear relationship between two variables. Um, so we've got, we're gonna do that with weight and height. So we're quickly gonna plot that. And we're gonna look at the linear relationship between the two variables, weight and height. And these are just, again, just basic plots so we can visualize the data as we're working with it. We can see here that there appears to be a couple of outliers. We've got a couple of patients who appear to be below 90 centimeters in height. Now we don't know if this is typos. Um, this particular data set has been used for a lot of different things, including data cleaning, um, as evident by earlier videos. So those values in that fictional data set might be there to identify potential values that need to be checked. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually remove them from our data set, and we're just gonna continue using square brackets to subset to make sure height is above 100. And what we've got there when we plot is we've got a relatively consistent kind of um, linear trend of as height increases, as weight increases, height increases. Um, so now what we're gonna do is gonna get the correlation between the two. And the correlation can be calculated just with the basic COR function, saying for correlation. Um, so we do that with the two vectors. So we've got a height vector with a subset of height greater than 100, the weight vector with a subset height greater than 100, and we've got method saying Pearson. Now that method um, argument can take a couple of different inputs. So if we come down here and look at it, um, the method is a character string, which is why we've got quotation marks around it. And it's saying which method is used for calculating the correlation or covariance. So one of them is Pearson, which is the default. So if we didn't put a method, an input to the method argument like we have there, it would still just calculate the Pearson correlation. Um, but there are also other options such as Spearman. So with this line of code, I'm gonna highlight it and then run it. And we get, a, we get a single correlation value of 0.74. So the core function, the COR function, its only output when you run it like this is just the correlation. If you want a bit more information, what you can do is the core.test function. So it's COR.test. And the exact same arguments will give you a bit more information about what's happening there. So we've got the Pearson's product moment correlation. The data set used, the t-value, degrees of freedom, the p-value behind that correlation. We've also got a 95% confidence interval for that correlation of 0.74. Um, excellent, moving on. Um, again, we're moving through this fairly quickly. So the next thing we're gonna do is a linear model. So, as we've seen before, the linear model is done with the LM function. So LM stands for linear model. If we hover over it, like with most functions, we can see what things we might need in there. So first things we're gonna use is the formula notation. So here we've got weight, tilde, height. And the way this reads is weight as a function of height. So Y is our dependent variable and height is our independent variable. So what we're testing to see is what effect does height have on weight? As height changes, how does weight change? And the data argument, is, as we've seen in many test functions already, data argument tells us what data we're using, and we're saying data equals pulse data, subset with square brackets to be height greater than 100. This is where the data argument can be somewhat useful. 
if you're running multiple linear models on lots of different parts of your data set um, using the same variables, but just testing different things, you can keep the same code, but maybe just change what is happening here in the data input. And that can be a great way to track what you're doing. Um, similar to a no the ANOVA function, or sorry, the AOV function, if I just run the LM function, I don't get a lot out being called to the screen. I get what the call is and I get what the coefficients are estimated to be. Um, but if I want more information than that, what I can do is I can save it as an object. Here I'm calling it my LM, and I can put that object in a summary function, which gives me more information. Of course, I could just put the LM code straight into the summary um, function in the brackets, but sometimes it's good to keep the model object around for use later on. So what I get out of the summary function for my LM is the call, I get some residuals, I get the coefficient estimates like I did before, but now I also get standard errors and p-values for both of them. Um, this is the significant code. I don't know if we've talked about that previously. Um, basically, it's a star system that um, software like R uses to help really quickly identify for significant p-values. So if there's three asterisks or three stars, basically means the p-value is between zero and 0 0.001. Two stars means the p-value is between 0 0.001 and 0 0.01. One star or asterisk means it's between 0 0.01 and 0 0.05. Um, so those three stars um, ratings basically what's generally defined as significance if you use 5% as the significance cutoff. A single dot means it's between 0.05 and 0.1. So, you know, close to significance. And if there's nothing, it's basically just above 0.1 and obviously less than one. Um, we also then get some model output, multiple R squared, adjusted R squared, et cetera. Um, the summary function is a very useful function that can be applied to lots of different test outputs and model outputs. So it's a very versatile function. So it's always good to check the documentation how the summary function applies to the object that you're dealing with. Yeah, but that's how we get a lot of information out about our linear model. Some other really quick things we can do is we can do some visual plots to check for assumptions. And we can just put that linear model object into the plot function. And what it basically does is it asks us to hit return to see the next plot. So down here on the console, if we hit enter, It'll go through a couple of plots for us to see, to visualize them. So first here we see the residuals versus fitted values. Um, so there's some parts of checking how linear model, linear model fits to see if there's how the residuals are distributed. We can see that there. We also get a normal QQ plot to see the distribution of values, um, distribution of residuals, I mean. Um, we get a scale location plot, plotting the standard um, square root of standardized residuals. And then we also get a leverage um, and Cook's distance plot. Again, we're not talking about the, start of the statistical theory behind those plots. Um, we encourage you to learn that, either by talking to a statistician or going to some other workshops. Um, but that's not the focus of these videos. Um, but that's just a really quick way to use the plot function um, to see that information. A couple of other things you can do um, from the cut car package, there is the outlier test function. So we just put that, applied that function onto the MyLM object. And we get some information there. And we can also just really quickly do the QQ plot function as well, which is another useful way because it also has a confidence interval around the line. Yes, so that video is basically just look, this video, I'm sorry, has been just quickly looking at some of the continuous um, methods to look at continuous data and quantitative data, um, and the, co the common basic tests we can use for that. Um, we, we encourage you to look through the book and try the examples there, work through the activities we've done and also the activities in the book. Um, and by all means, come to the workshops, come talk to us if you've got issues and we can work with you on any projects you might have and check out the other videos. But the best way to learn R is by doing. So I encourage you just to get in there and do it. Thank you very much.